Now we were talking yesterday as we uh, concluded our time about the temple in Ezekiel 40, 42. And again, as we approach the text, it is in an apocalyptic vision. But remember that those visions are the, in the vision we are having recounted for us exactly what the recipient is seeing and experiencing. And we take that at the face value of the events. Now those events may represent something, and they do at times, or they may just be the events that are taking place, which in this case you have Ezekiel going and measuring the various aspects of the temple plan and its design in great detail and has been exhorted by the divine interpreter and his divine guide to be sure, in fact this he's exhorted more than once, to be sure he writes these things down specifically and communicates them to the exiles. In other words, the, the vision is not just for him to have a nice time taking a trip to, you know, to Jerusalem and, and checking these things out, so to speak. But he is to communicate these things to the exiles. Uh, we touched a bit on some of the hermeneutical issues there. Uh, those who come to these chapters, 40 to 48, and immediately have difficulty with the fact that there's a temple and that there are sacrifices and that there are priests and that there's discussions of the land and so forth and don't like that uh, and say how could this be really when you stop and ask the question where then can they go if I don't understand these things in a normal way and that's not to say they don't have at times representative and communicative aspects because we've talked about the fact for example that the temple is a visual representation of God's presence in their midst that's true throughout the whole Old Testament uh, when they think of the you read in the Psalms when they want to you know uh, they're wanting to return to the temple, or as we talked about, rebuilding the temple after the captivity. Why? Just so they have a, a building? No, because this is the place where they worship God. This is to them an, a, a visual representation of God's presence among them. That God has to live there, they has to be there all the time. No, they don't think that. It's just where they, in their mind sight, this is a representation to them, but it's still a real temple in that case. So, uh, I, as I've said to you, I think we have here a real temple. I think we have real sacrifices. I think we have real priests uh, that he is uh, seeing in this situation. And I think it is reflecting probably in the best way millennial context. Though, as I've said to you, with the prophets, things are not always as clear-cut as we like. They, they put everything in, in a bag together. And so when you look at the things and the issues here in these chapters, you look at the end of Isaiah, you look at other prophets, the eternal state, and when you look at even the Revelation, the eternal state and the millennial aspects, there's a lot of similarities, but there are some differences. And we cannot always clearly at least I can't, uh, start all those out. Say, well, you know, that, that verse is the millennium and this verse is the new heavens and the earth and that one's this one. Uh, we can see certain things that are different and I mentioned some of those yesterday and we'll see some more today. There are great similarities. There are some things that are different which show us there, there is differences but there are great similarities and that's why uh, I have kind of looked at the millennium as the preface to the eternal state, or you might just want to say the preview, or what, whatever word you want to come up with in that type of situation. 
A lot of questions are asked, and let me just talk about some of the questions that arise in these chapters, and then we'll look more specifically from 43 on at the uh, actual text. But uh, many people will say, well, is not the existence of a temple and priest and a sacrificial system a retrogression to Old Testament modes of worship? Uh, why would we do this? Why would we have it? Well, let me ask you a question. If you're an exile sitting there listening to Ezekiel, what would you understand if someone's trying to describe to you what it's going to be like in the future, in the kingdom, when you have worship and so forth? How would you understand that? We well, you'd understand it in the ways of things they know and understand. And, and that, they would use, that these uh, avenues of carrying on worship in the temple, they certainly were never bad. They're not bad things. They were there to worship the Almighty God. They were to give Him honor and to give Him glory. And so it would be a normal thing that this is what they would understand or that they would participate in. Is, is it outdated? Is seeing a sacrifice something that's just, oh, horrible, I shouldn't do that? Because we now have the reality of the death of Christ. And as I said yesterday, it's interesting, my daughter gets into these things so often. Uh, let me give you an illustration. We had the privilege when we lived in Israel, and we've lived there for altogether probably about three and a half years, we lived there. We went to observe the Samaritan Passover. I don't know if any of you have ever had an opportunity to do that. But the Samaritans still uh, observe Passover in a full sense of the word. And, and we're not just talking about the Passover around the table in the home. They actually observe the procedure uh, similar to what was in the Old Testament. I say that because there's been some developments in their process. There's only about 500 Samaritans in Israel living on Mount Gerizim and also some living very close, uh, uh, some living there very close to Tel Aviv in the site of Halon. Uh, we went out and watched and they had set aside a group of lambs, you know, as you were supposed to do. They had them in a special pen. They had been there for the prescribed amount of time. And the Samaritan priest came, and as they began, they went be, were proceeding through their service. And fortunately, this was in the daytime. Usually, it's not. Usually, it's at dusk. But this happened to be on Sabbath. Okay, so cause, so I could get some good pictures. They did for me on the daytime. Okay, so we were watching this, and they were going through procedure. And they finally brought the lambs, and they slit the throat, and they butchered the lambs, and they put them in these uh, pits to roast them. And uh, they kind of got mixed up a little bit with the Day of Atonement and started putting blood on people and so forth. That's why I say there's a little bit of a confusion that goes on in the process. Uh, but they did this, and my daughter was four years old. Okay? And we were thinking to ourselves, my wife and I, you know, uh, one, you know, I mean, these dear little sweet lambs. She had seen all those little lambs out there. And how's she going to respond to this? And so here the blood was flowing. These guys were pretty quick. All these priests were butchers in normal everyday life. So they knew what they were doing. And uh, the blood was flowing. And all of a sudden we heard this little voice next to us say, Mommy, Daddy, is that what they did to Jesus? Wow. That's a four-year-old, okay? But you see, that was the whole purpose, really, of the visual manifestations in the Old Testament. They didn't save anybody. They were to be instructive as picture lessons of what the Messiah would do. And here's an example of a four-year-old who got the message. Okay? Because she understood and saw the picture in the process. But it didn't save her. 
We didn't suddenly have, you know, she's born again right there, you know, just because she saw this and just because she made that statement. No, it was instructive to her and it was that which caused, you know, us all, you know, having observed that Passover and you see what, you know, you see the slaughter of the lambs, boy, there's a tremendous impact visually as God communicates visually, and we've seen God communicates in all ways uh, through Ezekiel. This guy's uh, found every avenue he can kind of find to communicate. So I, I don't have difficulties. I'll be very honest with you. I have difficulties that we would uh, declare in a sense of commemoration and memory to Jesus what he did by uh, executing visual demonstrations that are reminders to us of what he did. He will not go back and be on the cross. Uh, that will not happen, but we can remind ourselves of that even as we do in the observance of the Lord's table, which is a, a another pictural, commemor pictural commemoration, which our Lord tells us in the Gospels he's going to celebrate with us in the future, when we're there with him, you know. So there will be worship. It will have, it appears, manifestations. Uh, very, and I would say in this case, you're going to have people worshiping, carrying on uh, Old Testament types of worship. You're going to have people carrying on the Lord's table. Is this a problem? I don't necessarily think we're going to have people, you know, okay, all Jews to the left, uh, all church people to the right. You can't do that and they can't do this. And we're going to separate and worship. I, I personally see, you know, look, guys, we're going to spend eternity together. All us believers, because we're brothers. Yes, God has clear, definite uh, workings and things that he's done differently. And in his program for Israel, he has this program for the church. But in eternity, we're going to all be standing there together giving praise and honor and glory and majesty to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm not going to say, oh, you're a Jewish believer? Oh, man, you're over there. Anyway. No, we're one. We're serving him. So they are the recipients. The recipients are the house of Israel in this case. And uh, the description of the worship here in, in the Messianic kingdom, it should be, it seems to me, in terms both understandable to Israel as well as in keeping with their covenant worship, with the way in which they have manifested their worship, the ways in which God has instructed them uh, to worship him, which he felt was very good in that place. So the entire, and also keep in mind that the entire worship procedure is designed both in the Old Testament and in the kingdom to point to God's holiness. And man, I think today in many ways we need to stop and think about what we do when we call it worship. Because I think sometimes, uh, to me as I look in the scripture, the object of worship is God. And yet often as I go into some churches, it seems the object is us. You, know, you listen to the songs you sing. Are they worshiping? Are they praising? Are they declaring the glory and the majesty of God? Or are they talking about what I get? Our focus needs to be on him. To give him praise. And praise is the declaration of who God is and what he does. It comes from the very root term of confess. I make a confession of who God is. That means I need to know him. That means I need to declare his name. I need to do that which will show who he is. And certainly uh, the sacrificial offerings that are there are here are things like the Passover are declaring what he has done and his greatness. The basic emphasis throughout Ezekiel 40 to 48, as we will see, is on God's holiness. He's reminding the people that though you have profaned me for the past and your history, when I gather you and restore you and cleanse you and the Spirit of God is within you and we gather together to worship in the end time, in the millennial kingdom, 
and on into the eternal state, we're going to focus, we're going to be holy. We're not going to be profane. We're going to do things God's way. And we're going to declare his holiness. And it's going to be true both in the temple and in the worship itself. This in a sense, you might say by the flow of Ezekiel's argument, now that it were, we're at the end, that we're at the final time, we're going to have the opportunity to worship God correctly. And we're going to do it that way. We're going to do it in purity and we're going to do it in holiness. Now when you look at uh, what is given in uh, the sacrifices and, uh, and the functions of the priests, it is a predominantly mosaic. There are some omissions and there are some modifications in this. But uh, it is predominantly mosaic and I think the modifications and some of the differences are simply that we might see clearly how the harmony that goes throughout the covenants of God, and the fact that he now reigns, and the fact that in the new covenant sin is done away with once and for all. And there are certain glimpses of that that go along. Uh, but they are showing his holiness and the glory uh, that he does manifest in that, in, in that particular situation. Uh, there are those who have difficulty saying, well, uh, the relationship of Ezekiel's sacrificial system and the New Testament teaching of Christ's death is finished and complete. How can you have that? Uh, maybe I've missed something. I, I don't have a whole lot of difficulty at that point. Jesus has finished his work. He has done it. Do, does that mean I should never, ever, ever uh, look at uh, somebody observing Passover. I should never think about that at all. I should never think about the concept or even manifest it that uh, there would be a sin offering for sin. I have difficulty with that because those were never efficacious anyhow. They didn't ever say. The offerings and the feast never, 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 ever, and never will save anybody. They were picture lessons, or if you like the word type, and I, I kind of stay away from that a little bit because I think it gets a little, it can get a little fuzzy. But they were picture lessons of what he would do. They were to instruct. They were to honor the work that he would accomplish. But Jesus, yes, has done a finished work. Yes, he has done the new covenant. He has forgiven sin once and for all. Once and for all. That's one of the marvelous truths. One of the great truths of the new covenant. He will remember sin no more. We do not have to be reminded. And the memorials for the people. So as they looked forward to what would happen. No we don't have to. If we never did those that's fine. I've never offered a sin offering. Okay. But I would not be offended to see someone do that in a memorial way unless they thought that was saving them. And then we need to sit down and have a talk, you know, about that, if that's what one thought. But the actual picture is a beautiful picture of substitution, reminding us of what he did, reminding me of what he did, and reminding us of what he did for us, and helps us understand in a clear way. Mm -hmm. Question about um, concerning the feasts of Israel and the celebration of that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in Galatians uh, chapter four, verse ten, Paul says, uh, "You observe days and months and seasons and years." And I'm afraid I may have labored uh, over you in vain. And so my uh, question is twofold: um, How do you relate Paul's seemingly admission to that has been done away with and Mm -hmm. um, how do you relate that to what you said? And number two, um, having participated in those feasts, uh, mm -hmm. coming from Jewish missions, uh, one of the results that I have found, at least in this country, and I obviously couldn't speak to Israel, they give a different thing there, mm -hmm. is that many times it becomes a stumbling block for other Christians because they see that and they see, oh, is there something that I'm missing? Uh, so can you speak to that? 
Well, this comes back to the whole perspective and attitude of which one approaches and how they've been instructed concerning truth. If one uh, does not understand what Jesus has done, and this was done in worship, I think one would need to explain to one what it is a picture of. Otherwise, why are we doing this? Even for Israelites back in the, in the, in the Old Testament time. Unfortunately, I think we read the fact that all, they went through the motions. So that, what does God say to them at times? You know, I, I would prefer obedience rather than sacrifice. You know, don't go through the religious motions. I hate your offerings. God will say that at times through the prophets. I hate your sacrifices. Well, you know, he, he, he doesn't mean by that that they're bad. Or else he would have never given them. But you come to them without understanding what they're doing. You don't even pay attention to what you're doing. So you've missed the point of them. If that's the case, don't do them. If you're missing the point. If it were a stumbling block in some way, and, I, and one were aware of that, I don't think they should do that. You know, I don't think we should put stumbling blocks. I don't think, I think Paul in his context... When you understand the, the legalism and, and the great uh, fact that you had to do all of this from the rabbinical Jewish perspective to be saved. That's what they really understood. If you're going to be part of the people of God, and by that, by that I mean Judaism, Israel, in, in New Testament times. You had to go through all of the 693 things and you had to go through all the steps and do all these things. And then you're one of us. It was not the fact of believing in the Messiah. I'm not saying there was no one that, that held that. But by and large, as a people, they didn't hold that. And so I think the correction there is appropriate on the part of both Jesus and Paul. Where they say, this is not what you were not saved by the works of the law. You're not. Never have been, never will be. Guys, you've got it all messed up. You've got it all wrong. You, you, you've put the spin on this thing that, is, uh, that has twisted it and made it wrong. And in that case, I think they needed to come down hard on that. And uh, say, you know, for you, in your context, uh, guys, you need to make sure we, you're doing what is right. That does not make the offering, however, in itself inherently wrong bad and wrong any more than when Jesus, you know, when God says in the Old Testament, I hate your sacrifices. You know, he's not doing away with them. He's just wanting them to do them with understanding so that they get the message that points them to the person of the Messiah. And they weren't doing that. They were just going through the religious motions. And that's, of course, uh, a, a downside <laughs> to any kind of worship. I'm, you know, I'm afraid today we go through the motions in our worship. I will confess to you, and I'm probably not the only one in this room, that there are times when I sing the songs in worship because I like the tune. Okay? And I know the words, I know them by memory, so I don't even think about them. And I get through and I wonder, what did I sing? I don't know if you've been there. I do that far more often than I'd like. And I have tried under the guidance of the Spirit to focus in worship. Even if I need to close my eyes so that I'm not distracted. And really concentrate on what am I singing? What am I reading? What is being read in the scripture? And focus on the person of God. Otherwise it just becomes a religious exercise. That's empty. And I think God would say to me, I don't want your singing. It doesn't mean anything. So I, have, I don't see any conflict. I understand Paul. I, I would say to Paul, amen, brother. You know? Uh, this is something, this is nothing that's going to help you be saved. This is nothing that's going to help your spiritual life. You have the spirit for your spiritual life. You have the death of Christ for salvation. That's it. But if these help you understand that better, great. You know, whatever avenue I have to communicate God's truth, I think that's wonderful in that case. 
And in that sense, the worship in this context and the worship even with the Lord's table. And I use that because we have a, a commemoration also. And uh, Jesus is saying we're going to do that commemoration in heaven. Where, you know, when you're going to be with me. Uh, we're going to still commemorate what I've done. Uh, is, it, is it bad for the Jews to commemorate what he did in their way? Uh, I don't think so. You know? So in that Mm-hmm. Could you please clarify, uh, can we at least theoretically uh, imagine that the author of Hebrews would uh, say to his audience that it's okay to continue the Old Testament sacrifices, but uh, just make sure you do it in a commemorative way. Uh, could you comment on that? Because it doesn't seem to uh, really come together. Okay, uh, let's say something about, and I'm just, uh, let me talk about uh, the writer of Hebrews, because interesting, it is the book to the Hebrews. And uh, I think it's instructive, especially chapters 7 to 10, in this respect, uh, where he talks about the elements of the tabernacle. He talks about the temple and its furnishings. He says they're only copies of the heavenly things. I agree. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. He says that. They're copies. Uh, I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, and uh, though they needed to be purified with the sacrifices, the real need of purification, as he makes clear, was made by Christ's sacrifice. And I would say amen. They're only a picture lesson of the need of cleansing. Of what, you know, and these things are only copies. They're only are shadows, as he used also the word, or as we mentioned yesterday, shadows of things to come. Well, uh, they are shadows uh, of things that have come, just as the Lord's table is as well. They are not the reality itself. The writer of Hebrew makes that clear. Uh, I would make that clear. I don't see why that would not be clear to those who have come to know him in the kingdom. This is not, I'm not, I never was saved by the sacrifices, the feast, and that whole system. It was to be instructive. It was to help me learn. But it didn't save me. It was a copy. It was a shadow. Now I have the reality that's come. Do I need to do the shadows? Do I need to observe these things? Absolutely not. I don't have to do that. But in worship of him to commemorate him, I personally don't see that that's a problem, especially for the Hebrew people. Repeated sacrifices, as he says, never could take away sins, the writer of Hebrews says. It's absolutely true. The sacrifice is cleansed, in a sense, only outwardly as a picture. Jesus cleanses inwardly. That's absolutely true because he is the reality of the picture at that point. If most of the if the mosaic sacrifices could have cleansed and made them perfect, then it all would have stopped. Then we wouldn't need this Messiah. But that wasn't the case. Uh, so they were constant reminders of them because they forgot so easily. Just as the Lord's table is a reminder to us, so that we don't forget, and we say, "How could I ever forget that?" But those are reminders for us. And the writer of Hebrews says for us that where sins have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. And I would say, amen, brother. There is no need, no longer any sacrifice for sin. The sacrifices for sin that were there were to keep before them what he would do. There's no longer any need for that. There's nothing wrong with reminding us, however, later, just as we worship visually, it seems to me, of what he actually did. I don't think the writer Hebrew would be talking about that. There's no longer any need for picture lessons or reminders now that the reality of Christ is there. And the writer does, uh, does not declare, however, that the pictorial uh, sacrifice things are absolutely no longer to be observed as reminders simply says we don't need them because the reality is here. We understand that. But they never saved to start with. So what were they doing before? 
they were reminding them, helping them understand what it is that's, com that's coming for them. Okay. So since they were only pictures at that time, there never was conflict with the sacrifice of the Messiah. Yes, some people got it twisted in their mind. I think probably today people have it more twisted in their mind than the, than the Hebrews may have had. Because, unfortunately, the Old Testament's gotten a lot of bad press. You know, it's all bad, you, you don't do any of that, and so we become antinomian in, in our approach. Uh, likewise, I'm convinced that the sacrifices in the millennial system described by Ezekiel are only picture lessons and reminders and memorials and commemoration of what he did. So my conclusion in that sense would be on the basis of the Old Testament role of sacrifices as well as the argument of the writer of Hebrews. It does not appear that pictorial sacrifice of the Mosaic system nor the memorial sacrifices of the millennial worship conflict with the finished and complete work of Christ's sacrifice for all sins once and for all on the cross. They were used simply in worship to commemorate what he did, just as we will also observe the Lord's table. Now, I, I'm first one to tell you that uh, this is a this is debated, and there are people that uh, would not agree with me at that point. I want you to understand, I do not see that these are a substitute for Jesus. They are not. He has finished the work. They are not needed. The Lord's table is not needed in the sense of the finished work, but it's given to us as an avenue of worship. Okay? And it's an avenue that we'll do when we are, and, it, and he's already died. It's a finished work. But it's an avenue we'll continue to celebrate, not just now, but when we are with him. And I think there will be other forms of worship at that time, not just the Lord's table. Mm -hmm. Could we see any other fulfillment agreements that is like the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, or the fulfillment of the covenant made to the priest in <coughs> Numbers 25 about a perpetual priesthood? Well, I think that we're going to see there is a priesthood uh, that functions at this time simply to carry out the worship process. There will be a prince that will also be the leader of worship uh, who is not the Messiah himself because uh, he has children and he makes uh, atonement for his own sins. Uh, if, he, if he's, and a lot of people have wanted to make him the David, you know, the, the Messiah and, and we've got some major problems. If we do that, if we have uh, the Messiah himself is making atonement for himself and he has children, then um, things don't quite connect. Yes, uh, as we've already stated, all of the covenants, whether you have you know, the Abrahamic covenant, the relational fact, and, uh, and the importance of commitment and following Christ in the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the fact that the line of David, of Judah and David, that the, uh, the descendant will reign, he will reign at that time, the new covenant, with, the, outpour, with the, the fact that sin is done away with once and for all, and the Spirit of God indwells the, the people. These are all true at that end time for the people of Israel when they turn to him under the new covenant. That's when they experience it as a nation. And they are at that point uh, with him, restored, cleansed, and worshiping him in perfect security and in perfect safety under what uh, I think Ezekiel calls the peace covenant. I think those are, things are all true. It all has its, in a sense, culmination at that time. Mm -hmm. Some of us probably have a very strong aversion to animal sacrifice as a means of worship, and yet, it, according to your interpretation, will be a prescribed method in the future. Should that be a principle for us not to be so closed against other avenues of worship today, such as interpretive dance, drama, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think we're often uh, limited in the ways in which we worship God and focus upon Him. Uh, I think, and this is just my opinion, 
I think that we need probably more variety in our worship so that it doesn't become routine. When things become routine, they either become traditional or we become mesmerized by them and they, and they begin to lose their meaning. Uh, that's our problem, not God's problem. You know, one of the things we do in our situation in Moscow, just this is one kind of small thing to try to keep things fresh. Maybe I can use that term. We observe the Lord's table the first Sunday of every month. And we have seven elders, and we have a different elder who plans the Lord's table service. That's all we do in the service. Let's focus on and we have a different elder that plans it each week, each pardon me, each month. And it's different. Uh, obviously, the Lord's, the focus is, and, and, and the elements and all that is not different. But the actual worship and, and the flow and so forth is different. And the people look forward to that. Because it's not like, oh yes, now this is the Lord's table. So, you know, I can sleep now because I know what they're going to do for the next 20 minutes, you know, etc. I'm being a little bit facetious at that point. But it's very easy to do that. And it's just that's this is somewhat this is even somewhat minor, but I think it keeps a freshness in that. I think we do need to, Ezekiel has certainly showed us there's a lot of ways to communicate and we need to communicate, and there's a lot of ways in which we can worship God. And as I said to you, you know, the basic concept of worship and is to prostrate ourselves before God. And I frankly I can't remember the last time I was in an evangelical church where anybody prostrated themselves before God. Why? Well, because we're afraid we go to dirty, you know, our clothes dirty. We have on our best. I think that's, I'll be very honest. I think that's one of the things, you know, plus what would people think? You know, I mean, you know, this is going a little too far. It's a little fanatic. Well, is it God? Who is God? And who am I at that point? He is almighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords. Who am I? You know, in Ezekiel, when God appeared to him, what did he do? I fell on my face. You know, I, I think maybe we have a ways to go in worship. And uh, that way. Okay, yes. The instruction given to the priest at the end of 44 is just like what we read back in the Mosaic Covenant. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in verse 26, it says, after he is cleansed, Seven days shall elapse for him on the day that he goes into the sanctuary. And in the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering. That does not sound like a memorial. Mm -hmm. That sounds more like what they did back a couple of thousand years ago. Or okay, but why did they do it a couple of thousand years ago? Did that... Sin offering save them? No. They saw it as a reminder of what he would do. They, they're looking future. We, they look forward to the work that the Messiah would do for them by faith. And we look back to the work he did do for us by faith. And those were instructive elements within their descriptive way of thinking. Uh, as we've talked about the Hebrew pictorialness. This was a way in which they were instructed by these, and they did this as a continual reminder, one, of how sinful they are. And I think that's uh, part, of the re part of the worship and the reminder that, that you have here. Is there anything wrong with us in our worship today, or at any other time, to remind ourselves what he saved us from? What he did? I don't think that's a problem to be reminded that I am a sinner, I, that he died for all my sin. If, it, if I hadn't been a sinner, he would have never had to die. So I'm reminded of what he did. In that sense, I praise him. I declare his greatness for the fact that he took me out of sin and he gave me forgiveness and he has accepted me. I'm accepted in Christ. And because of his resurrection, I now am no longer dead, but I'm alive. And every way that I can manifest that in worship to declare that to him and to give praise and honor and then follow that with thanksgiving for what he has done, that I now am a child of God. 
I think that's worship, declaring his greatness and wonder. And I think for them, it was part of their worship. And when they did this, when they would come and bring their sacrifices and make their testimonies, there was oral statements also, and we see that connected with a lot of the Psalms. Uh, this was part of their worship. And they would take hours to do this and, and uh, get the beautiful picture of how God is pleased with this, with the sweet-smelling savor that comes unto, the, unto God. Yeah, it's a graphic picture, but that's the way they were understanding, and that's the way they were communicating truth. They were to be reminded of this continually of what he would do, just as we should be reminding ourselves of what he has done. That doesn't mean we're living in the past. It means we're living in the reality of the fact of what he did. It just happened to be done at a past time in history for us. Um, mm -hmm. Clarify um, with some of the language in, in Leviticus when it says that it just seems like it's over and over again how it says that the priest shall make atonement when when a sin offering is brought and that language is what sure. the word atonement is right atonement the basic concept and the meaning of the word is to cover and so there again it's a it's an instruction when atonement is made the, the sin is covered. And it was important for them to do that and required of them to do that so that there would be the continual uh, reminder of them that they are covered. This is the only way that sin can be dealt with. But it was not, and I think they understand, it was not fine. It did not, the sin of the animal did not cover their sin once and for all. Or it, it, that was with the Messiah who would come. They were learning in that process. Mm -hmm. And the re and within the uh, within the uh, system here in the Ezekiel forty forty eight, we have the situation where they they do atonement or covering or in the sense of purification for even the elements of the temple itself uh, to demonstrate the difference between the holy and the profane, and the only way that something can be holy is for it to be. It's for there to be an atonement, a covering for sin, so that it can be pure and cleansed. Uh, very graphic instruction. Yes. Yeah, that was my question. It was just concerning like in Leviticus 16, when they made atonement, they made atonement for the objects within, mm -hmm. well, at that point, the tabernacle. Right. And then the objects is uh, almost invariably both uh, in, the, in the mosaic system, and I think by equally in, uh, it will, for lack of a better term, we'll call it the Ezekiel system or the millennial system it was uh, when you do things it's a purification factor now when you do people there's purification also but there's it's it's more than just a purification of an object in that fact yeah. so uh, more than a memorial it was more <coughs> efficacious it was more of an atonement it was not that? efficacious no absolutely not that's used, the peel and which is more of an atonement of something that's being caused upon, being brought upon you. It is a covering for sin for that particular person that has to be done by the, sh by the shed blood. That's a picture lesson of what he would do, but that did not save them. That was not an efficacious act for them. Never saved anyone, and as we looked in Leviticus, even Leviticus, there was no salvation, as a matter of fact. But well, I think there was salvation. I think salvation is by faith in the work the Messiah would do, and 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 in the revelation that God has given of that, which is which is progressively unfolded in the Old Testament. You know, when I come uh, to the situation back with. And Adam and Eve, and you know, and God tells them, you know, there will be a male singular who will fatally wound Satan. That's the revelation they have. They didn't fully understand who the, uh, probably the masculine singular was, unless you understand Genesis 4.1, the et, as a, a sign of the direct object, rather than trying to somehow make it a preposition, in which basically it appears Eve said, you know, I've had a man child, Yahweh. I think perhaps she understood exactly what was happening in that situation. Now, she wasn't right. <laughs> you know, it was Cain. But from what the revelation she had that God had given to her, she believed it. 
You know, Abraham believed God and it was counted for him for righteousness where he was. But God is unfolding that. We have already had sacrifice of, of Abel by that time where God has said, let me tell you which one's the kind I like. You know, you know, cool it, cool it Cain, you know, you can do what's right too. You know, you're not, you're not out of the ball game. You know, it's just Abel has by faith brought the kind that, and we, we would kind of assume at that point when we come to the writer of Hebrews that there had been instruction we don't have that recorded in Genesis, but of the right of the kind of offering to bring, to bring a blood sacrifice. Why? Because it's a picture lesson. We're starting. We're unfolding this thing, and we're going to tell you about the Messiah and what he's going to do. And he, there's going to have to be in this whole process of deliverance from sin a blood sacrifice. There's going to have to be blood that's shed. Okay? And that's your very first concept of sacrifice. And then it continually unfolds. It's beautiful to watch the unfolding of God's revelation throughout the scriptures in this way. And to see that these things are, are pointing to the Messiah. They're pointing to Jesus. You, they didn't know his name. Anything like that? At that time, they didn't even know the word Messiah. They weren't talking about kings because a king, a Messiah is an anointed one. Uh, every king in Israel was a Messiah, but the Messiah, the anointed one, will be of the line of David. Of course, that comes with the Davidic, constantly unfolding there. Uh, but it's a learning time, and they would worship him and praise him for what they knew of what he would do in the picture lessons that God had communicated to them. And I'll tell you, if there's something, I, if there were a time machine again, I'd love to go back and sit in on the worship services at the time of the kings of David. Or if you, we have very few glimpses. You go look at the one in Second uh, uh, Chronicles 29, the worship time of Hezekiah and the dedicate, rededication of the temple. Boy, I tell you, people wouldn't like that. They wouldn't want to go to that worship service, you know quarter of the day they sat there and read the scriptures and they offered the sacrifices 700 animals that were sacrificed it takes a little while guys you know and uh, they were there all day and we have people that you know if you go over 60 minutes man, I've got a problem you know well fortunately at least my Russian friends I can go longer than 60 minutes but uh, we Americans we can't do that but you know just the worship just to spend the time reading part of the commemoration of God and worship of him is to read what he has revealed to read the word to use the pictures that declare what he's done what other kind of worship are we going to do we think it only means we stand around and sing songs well music is very much a part of worship but I hope you know singing songs is not worship it is an avenue to worship, provided we sing that which is to the glory of God and focuses upon him. You know, and not uh, little ditties like, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Can you imagine that with Peter and them out there on the Sea of Galilee? Is he sinking? You know, I'm sure he wasn't singing that. Yeah. Uh, that just doesn't fit. Yes. Together to say, to say that the sacrificial system is really where the rubber meets the road, uh, but the real issue is obedience through faith. Uh, it's not that sacrifices were necessary to save, but obedience and faith to what God commanded was. So when Christ died, He did away with that application of the sacrifices, and He gave us, in a sense, a new application to it. Uh, the requirement to offer the sacrifices was was done away with, um, and he gave us a new requirement to trust in Christ. All right, that's, that's right. right. Plus, the pictures uh, have now had their reality. What they've been portraying for us now have their reality, and I am supposed to have been trusting in the reality all along. And as I said, historically, in the context of the New Testament, as it opens. You've got people that they, their, their trust is in the things they do, in their, in their sacrifices, in, their, in all of their rituals of, clean, of cleaning, of cleanliness, you know, and washing of hands and all of these things. And if you don't do that, you're not one of the people of God. Well, if you believe in Jesus, you are, you know. 
Uh, that's not the issue. Are those things bad? No, they were pictures of what would be true. But that's not what, that's not the real issue. And so, no, I don't need to do that. And that's what Paul and, and Jesus are saying in their context because everybody was so, so hung up on that. You know, it's just like you can find, <clears throat> find people that go in and they have to, they have to do their incense and they have to do, you know, have their icons where I live. And if you don't do that, then you're not a good Christian. You're not, you know, there's something wrong. There's a question about your relationship with God. Why? You know, I, I, and we could get into that because I think they, there's a lot of misunderstanding, even historically, of what went on with, I, uh, you know, icons. But uh, we, we cannot do away with something because we don't do that today. You know, we say we don't, you know, we don't have an affinity for, for animal sacrifice. Perhaps part of the reasons why we don't like animal sacrifice is too graphic of what happened. And uh, if you, I don't know whether it's okay or not to go see the, what do they call it, the passion? But one thing that comes across is, I tell you, when Jesus died, it wasn't fun. You know, it was, it was horrible. And I, I think these help us understand that. Just like my daughter, four years old, said, is that what they did to Jesus? Yes, it is. It's what they did, and that's exactly what it was trying to communicate and to teach. Now, you need a, you need a temple to have the worship, and you need the priest to give the direction and, and, and to carry it out. So, or to carry the function of doing it. Uh, I'm not sure... What do we do with all this if it's not something that's actually happening that he's seeing within the vision and that he is to tell to the people? Uh, is he just telling them that so they can think of something to what it all means? And what would you say it means? Well, that's the problem I have. I don't have any answer. Mm-hmm. Well, the Qumran community, uh, even as reflected among uh, some of the other, even in the biblical writings, that people were upset with what was going on, not everybody obviously, uh, with what was going on in the Jerusalem temple. You see that even in the temple scroll. Uh, in addition, uh, additionally found later, uh, or at least recovered, would be a better way to put it, by uh, Yigil Yadin. Uh, these, are, um, these are the anti-establishment, <laughs> if I can put it in that terms, of that day. They, in, a religious, in a religious context. Uh, they didn't like the, the liberalness that was going on there, and I think they had some, some very good reason. The only problem is that sometimes when you don't like something and so you go against it, you know, you take the pendulum and you go, you know, you go to the extreme the other way. And so we have some of that reflected uh, within the Qumran community and their thinking. But... Uh, I, that's, that's a contemporary situation there at that time. I'm not particularly sure what that's going to do for us here. Okay. Yes. Uh, just in looking at the visions and applying a hermeneutic to the visions we've seen in Ezekiel so far, a question comes to my mind, and I'm not implying not to take these literally in, in regards to the temple, but I look at chapter 9, and we have a vision of a slaughter in, um, in Jerusalem. And the six men that are appointed, and then the, the man with the writing case, and so on and so forth. Well, we know that that literally didn't happen exactly as that vision went. The Babylonians were the ones that were responsible agents for destruction. When you come to the vision here, and we look at the vision there, how are we... How, what type of consistent hermeneutic are we applying to both of them to have 
do you understand what I'm getting at? Because, sure. Because something historically different occurred from there. How do we know then that with these particular details, because chapter 9 is also pretty detailed, there's specific details <coughs> given about these men and so on and so forth. And so I'm just wondering how to approach that. Well, I'm not necessarily convinced that what happened in Ezekiel 9, the vision didn't happen. Uh, the, uh, that's an argument from silence to start with. As I remember, I mentioned uh, silence argues both ways, uh, always. Uh, the actual judgment that was taking place, though it is, uh, though it is represented by the six executioners, uh, when we read the actual judgment that comes, the things that happen to the people are, are the same for them in the judgment. It's, in fact, we're given greater detail. I don't think we need in every situation to have all the details, uh, and I think that's borne out throughout the, the Scripture. We may have part of a judgment represented in one passage, and we have a further explanation in another. We even have that even when we look at the Gospels concerning Jesus. We have part in one place and part in another uh, as far as getting the full picture of what happened. Uh, whether people were marked or not prior to the invasion of the Babylonian situation, we don't know. They could have been. Uh, they may not have been. And at that point, we would say that this is a graphic of what will happen. But... I'm not convinced that, uh, and we have a very clear, in a sense, interpretation of that in the, uh, in the fact that the judgment actually came. And we know, and we can make the comparison between them. That these things are, uh, at times, representing what will happen. Uh, I think that's true. But here we had judgment, and we follow it by judgment. My question at this point is, we have here very clearly represented to the people of Israel a temple, a sacrificial system, a priestly system, and a division of the land. And it's pretty graphic and it's pretty detailed. Now, uh, just as we mentioned with the, um, the destruction in Ezekiel 39, of, you know, the weapons that came afterwards that uh, did they fight the battle with clubs and with bows and arrows and so forth. Uh, and as I stated to you, well, that's certainly possible. You know, and if it were to happen that way, that wouldn't uh, be surprise me at all because sometimes people are, you know, what we have today, uh, if you drop an, enough nuclear weapons on it, you may have to come out with bows and arrows and clubs, you know, because you don't have anything left. That's certainly a possibility uh, in the situation. But obviously that's what they understood in that context of that revelation. And that you want to come with tanks or missiles. I, I don't particularly have problems with that because they wouldn't have any understanding of what that is. But they did understand these things. Whether the worship is manifested in some other ways, I think we already know. Even from what uh, we're told by our Lord that there's other manifestations of worship. Uh, that are going on. I'm simply saying to you, I don't see that on the surface of what we have here, we need to suddenly say it has to be some other form of worship. The detail of it, uh, for us to come and say generally, well, they just worship, but they worship differently. Uh, those usually that argue here have a problem of thinking that uh, the sacrifice and so forth are something that really shouldn't be done. And usually it's because they, there's a, a latent thought there that somehow they're efficacious and we have a finished work of Christ. And people come to the New Testament and make that kind of argument. I'm not convinced that's a valid argument because they never were efficacious in the context. So I have no problem that there would be worship that could be manifested in the same way that worship was manifested under the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament as well as it would be manifested the way we might worship today. Uh, specifically, uh, we only have one manifestation of that in the sense of the word in the New Testament, which would be the Lord's table, or that there are new avenues as well. And certainly what this is telling us, if we do want to look at it in, in the broad sense, is yes, there will be worship, there will be the presence of God, it will be, uh, he will be present, uh, the relationship with the people is there. They were worshipped that will carry on. 
and uh, yet things are going to be different also. You know, when you have, when you look at the, the topographical changes and so forth. Uh, so, but I have no difficulty with what the text is saying, as I have no more, I don't have difficulty with the fact that you have a temple. Now we're told when we come to the eternal state, we don't, uh, you know, uh, just like we don't have a sea anymore. And when you come to the description of the topography here, the western boundary of the topography of the land uh, is the sea, the Mediterranean. Well, obviously the topography is going to be different in the eternal state. I think there's similarities, but obviously there's things are going to, there's, whether we want to use the word progress or, or change, or, you know, I don't like to use the word particularly evolution or evolve, but somehow, somehow that rings negative to me, and that shouldn't necessarily, but perhaps, but uh, we don't know all the details of what that, he's just giving us the, the picture lesson here, but it is given in some fairly specifics. He doesn't just say they're going to worship. And he does it within the Jewish context, I mean, or, or the Hebrew context here, which is what we would expect, because that's what they would understand. And that's why I say I have no problem that there's other additional manifestations of worship too. But if I'm to interpret this and tell you what does it mean, what do I tell you it means about all the details, uh, I'll just say all the details, the script dimensions of the temple? And what do I tell you that all these sacrifices and so forth are mean if they if they are not sacrifices? And what do I tell you that the priests are doing in their representation if it isn't what the text is telling us it's doing from a hermeneutic? What do I say? And how do I? On what basis do I do that? Do I say, well, I don't accept it. I take another hermeneutic. I'm going to take a figurative hermeneutic. At which point, it's a, it's a, it's a free-for-all. Because what, what I come up with, what you come up with, you know, what each one of us comes up with, nobody can say we're wrong. Because we, at that point, have no guidelines whatsoever. And interestingly, we don't have one who is particularly interpreting all these things as we've had before. It just basically is saying, here it is. This is what happens. Yes. Along the same line, in your commentary, you give us four principles, mm -hmm. hermeneutical principles, for the interpretation of visionary literature. Mm -hmm. And one of them, I think the fourth one, is that we don't take it literally, that we take it figuratively. We can take it figuratively. We uh, for me though is how do I know when to do that and is it just because that there's six chapters devoted to it because as you mentioned they wouldn't have understood anything else mm -hmm. so if he would have said anything else it wouldn't have made any sense whatsoever right so I'm not sure how we should really then take it for ourselves because this does not make sense for us today why doesn't it because we wouldn't do this. We wouldn't be... Why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. Well, right, yeah, I recognize we don't do it. But my sins have been forgiven. That's he, right. He died once and for all. That's right. And so I wouldn't be worrying about offering a sin offering or a peace offering or a burnt mm -hmm. offering. I wouldn't be worried about defiling myself about because I touched a dead person. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're doing all of these things. Um, uh, I wouldn't worry about it either. I don't think they worried about it. Because I don't think they are viewing that. I have no basis to say they're viewing that as that which is necessary to be done. So it's not necessary, why bother? Because it's, it's, it's a commemoration of what is done and is a reminder of what he saved us from. And, and the great work that he did for us in the way in which, we, which they understand uh, the great work that he did on their behalf on the cross. Because they didn't do that. They, I have no problem. They'll participate in the Lord's Supper. But I have no problem that I would participate in watching them do a sacrifice. Well, they did do the, the state of meal, the Passover meal. Yes. 
and the Passover is going to be observed here. And I think that's done in a descriptive way. As I mentioned to you, uh, in our family, we often observe the Passover when we have people in, and we do it uh, as best I can understand in my research of how it was done in New Testament times, uh, the time of our Lord, and then in the Last Supper, of which the Lord's table was part of that. And the more I understand Passover, the greater I understand what is taking place in the Lord's table. It enhances it because that was the context in which it was revealed. And then, of course, the people, when it was re revealed in New Testament times, would understand that. We need to go back and understand the Passover so we understand the full, get a, get a full understanding or a fuller understanding of the significance of what is being conveyed and communicated to us even in the Lord's table. I, I, I think our problem is that we, you're absolutely right, we don't do this. And, and no, I have no compulsion or fact that I need to go out and have animal sacrifices. But is it wrong? Is it bad? Let me put it that way. Is it bad to do that? <coughs> hmm? You think it would be bad? Why? Because Jesus once and for all died for our sins. But, is the, but by offering a sacrifice, tell us that he didn't? We're participate, we would be participating in something that he's not commanded us to do. Well, uh, that would be like the, the Catholics. Do we have to be commanded in like, every little detail there when we worship? But then, then we would be like the Catholics with their rosary and praying to Mary and praying. No, to no, Mary. no. I think it's your apples and oranges at that point. Here is something that God revealed to portray what he would do. That was the whole purpose of it. It did not save them. And, it, and by the fact that Jesus has died on the cross once and for all, does not negate the truth communicated in a sin offering or observance of Passover and so forth. It doesn't negate it at all. Because that truth is still true. We just now have fully have the reality and experience of it in Jesus, of which it was telling us would happen. And I, in that sense, I really, uh, I mean, if I want to go, I don't need to observe the Lord's table, except the Lord says, do it because I know you're going to forget otherwise. You know, do it in remembrance of me. But as far as doing it, I could say, well, he's died on the cross. It's a done deal. It's finished. And I don't mean that in any slight way. Uh, it's finished for me. Yes. I may have, I had to step out, so I may have missed somebody and, and if so, just mock me. Um, <laughs> one of the things I'm listening to is, I'm hearing this, there seems to be, maybe maybe I'm hearing correctly, maybe I'm not, you're, you're saying you'd have no problem for the offering of a sacrifice, and what people seem to be doing is adding a prepositional phrase to that, and then saying that what you mean by that is it would be a sacrifice for sin, and you're saying no, it just offer a sacrifice, period. That in and of itself is not inherently wrong, nor is it prohibited or anything else within right. the scripture. What would, what would catapult it into the area of sin or uh, error would be if you add that pre prepositional phrase of I'm doing this for the remission of my sins, which would also be an aspect of the rosary or some of the other things is that they're not doing that merely as an aid to uh, remember or this or that, but then the fact that there's a meritorious aspect attached to it. it that, that Absolutely. No, it's that. efficacious at that point. All right, so, so am I valid in hearing yes, that? Yes, absolutely. A, another question I have in, in all of this would be, I don't have time for it all. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> There, there, we're, we're merely looking at one book and one aspect of, of obviously Ezekiel and so that makes it far more difficult there's an ecclesiological issue that seems to be here obviously but it's not being spoken of because it's not germane to Ezekiel but I mean if if we are holding to a literal um, aspect of the kingdom being physically present on the earth i.e. premillennialism 
which I would accept, then the church is not here. And and one, some of the stumbling blocks also that I'm hearing is coming out of the rubric of, of the church. But the church isn't here. This is a uniquely Israel event where the nations are participating with Israel in the kingdom, whereas the church is not present in that unique sense. These are not, these are not part of the church. They're, they're Israel. Uh, is, that, is that a valid statement? I, I don't have the time, obviously, to say more. Am I, am I speaking at least semi-intelligently or at least... <laughs> I think you're whatever. speaking intelligently. No, I think, uh, yes, this is not, it is a focus to the exiles. The, the, again, we remind ourselves that his messages are directed towards the exiles. So it's directed towards the Hebrew people. And he's doing it in a context that would obviously in ways which are understandable to them as far as what will take place at that time. In that sense, the church is not in view now, that the church uh, will be present when we get in ultimately in the future, yeah. Well, and my point only is, is that in the old, mm -hmm. God gave certain things that were to be performed in the old. Mm -hmm. um, in the new covenant, and in, in specifically the church, he gave specific things that were to be performed. We are to perform the rite of baptism. We are to perform the... Uh, ordinance of, of the Lord's Supper. These are things that were given and we accept them and say this is what we do. That's right. And so we do them. And and I guess I'm not stumbling over it much is that I have no more of a problem that in the kingdom this is what we do. And here's you know now what what's lacking in these passages is the basis as to why. But <coughs> again I might be simplistic, but we don't need to know why because it's not for us. We just simply need to see that this is what will be done. Why, or the all the ins and outs, we'll figure that out when we're looking at it, but is it not sufficient to let the text say, here's what it is, and it's, it's easier to let the text say what it says, and scratch your head and say, that leaves a lot of questions as to the whys and the hows and the whats, but it's sufficient, versus saying, well, that's what it says, but we can't accept it because we're gonna we're going to come from this perspective, and therefore we have to come up with a completely new understanding of what every aspect of this means. Well, if I'm hearing you correctly, I think I would say, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Uh, and I, I say, I, this is expressing worship. This is not expressing salvation. This is worship. I, I repeat again, over and over again. The sacrifices, the offerings, the feasts never saved anybody. They were never efficacious. They were instruction. Instructions to people who were more descriptive in their way of thinking. That's why so much of the Old Testament is descriptive and pictorial. And things are only figuratively when they're stated to be so and very clearly so within the context of that particular literary genre but i have in my revision uh and you know we're doing a revision or we or whoever it is, is well i would be i'd have to be part of that a revision of the expositor's bible commentary <coughs> And they now have a amillennial among the amillennial editor in the Old Testament, and we've gone round and round. You know what he would he says to this? Well, it's all figurative, but he doesn't tell me what it means. And I don't know what it means if it's all figurative. You know what it represents. I have an Amil tell me, a very close friend of mine, that uh, the land in the Old Testament represents life. Why? Where? You know, I can come up and tell you it means something else, and why am I wrong? You know. Uh, now I'm not saying in every case they're just doing this arbitrary. I think at times they try to find things that are analogous or similar. But gentlemen, I, as I come to the text here, I don't see that I have a difficulty because the sacrifices and the, and the worship system of Israel was for worship of commemoration. It was not for efficacious. It was for instruction. It was what they did to remind themselves that they are sinners. They need 
a substitute to take their place. They need one who is like the lamb to sp spill his blood so that they could have a covering over their sin. And it wasn't the animal that did it. I couldn't amen or uh, he, the writer of Hebrews any greater than I don't know what. I mean, he's absolutely right. It's not by the blood of bulls and goats that I'm redeemed. Absolutely not. It's with the blood of Christ as he entered once into the holy of place. But these are instructions. The problem is we don't use pictures for instructions. We like to go and look at the New Testament propositional <laughs> statements, which are wonderful. And all of the things about you're redeemed by the blood and, you know, as a result and so forth. We go through the whole aspect of whether it be in propitiation and the expiation and so forth. And we would all say amen. Uh, that's, but the way they were instructing in the Old Testament was uh, when one's uh, sins are transferred to that animal as uh, he lays his hand on the animal, it's a picture that my sins are given to the animal and the animal is paying for the sins on my, part, on my part. And who does the lamb refer to? It refers to the Messiah who's going to come. And is that picked up later? It sure is. And John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was still a picture even in the New Testament times. They understood those pictures. Uh, and these are appropriate communication. If, however, I think this or anything else that I would come up with is going to save me, I'm absolutely wrong. And God's not interested and I wouldn't be interested. If, if to go to a worship service where everybody thinks that the Lord's table is going to save them. Or that, uh, you know, that the Passover is going to save them. Or take any manifestation of worship you want. It will not. It never did. It never will. But if I'm going to worship him, I have to worship him in some way to communicate to him in my human finiteness what I think he did for me what he did and who he is and what his greatness is. And I think there are many avenues to do that. And the Hebrews used an avenue of a pictorial description of sacrifices and feasts to do that. Okay? And yes, are they needed? No. Are they, are they commemorative? Yes. Okay? Are they an avenue to worship? I think so. And I have no problem that you would have priests in the Old Testament concept of wearing white linen to demonstrate the holiness of God. The picture lesson. Or do I need a priest? No. Is the priest a picture to me of the holiness of God? Yes. You know, and so forth. Uh, I, I must confess, I think one of the things that latently we're dealing with is that we have, we have been... Uh, subtly taught antinomianism for so long and we take out of context and, and misconstrue out of the historical context the things that Paul and Jesus say and we, we basically dump the whole Old Testament and say it's all bad. Now that's an overstatement but that's a latent concept that we find here often. If that's true then we just ought to take it and tear it apart and throw it away. You know, if that's really true. But you can go back. I can, I can share the gospel, by the way, and I've done it many times with Jewish people. I share the gospel and I only get to the New Testament to show them that this is exactly what they've been talking about the whole way in the Old Testament. And you know what? They accept Christ. It's amazing, isn't it? They understand those things. So, uh, I... I hope you understand. I'm not, I'm not against you. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I, I know. I do not think that a sacrifice at all is going to save anybody. And yes, the finished work of Christ is done. And uh, it is the reality of the shadows. I believe that with all my heart. But I have no problem that you can worship by means of expressing what God's done in a visual way. Mm -hmm say also that uh, these picture lessons that are being portrayed for us in Ezekiel would not be 
efficacious for um, us today or us in the church because we will no longer have a sin nature. It will be more for the nations and the um, people who are there who are not believers because will not during the millennial kingdom, there will be sin, there will be a sin nature for those, the offspring of those people who physically walk into the millennial From kingdom. From the tribulation. So, well, I mean, I think we're stumbling over these pictures, but the, but the pictures are not for us. The pictures are a reminder to us of what he did, but, but I'm glad you brought up the point because we do have non-believers that would be entering in to that context who for whom these would be visual pictures for them to learn of what's happening from that perspective. Um, that's a factor. But again, it's, they're still not efficacious at all for, any, for anyone at that point. Yes? Uh, going back to the sacrificial and the efficacious, uh, the symbolic and the efficacious, uh, we understand that in Leviticus it was more of a prospect of looking forward because there was never a memorial there. They were looking forward to the future. When we come to Ezekiel, now we say we are retrospective. We're looking backward, understanding that it happened, and we're doing it as a memorial. If we have to maintain a literal hermeneutics out here, uh, memorial should stand memorial in Leviticus, and memorial should stand memorial in Ezekiel too. Uh, why, why do we make a distinction? Because in, in Leviticus, we understand there is a ceremonial atonement, there is a spiritual atonement. And spiritually, they could only be atoned by their circumcision of the heart. Uh, there was a there was a ceremonial atonement, and that was more of kind of a efficacious understanding, a covering, like the word kafar. But when we come to Ezekiel, why do we change the efficacious into memorial? Because that would lead us into more problems. Because yeah, I I don't like the term efficacious at that point because I don't think that the what they did as they looked forward was efficacious. They were looking forward to what would be efficacious. I don't look to the Lord's table as efficacious. I mean, just to take the flip side of the whole thing from today. Uh, and I don't think that's why we do it, and I don't think that's why they did what they did. Uh, yes, they, they were required to do it because as I, as Joe Q. Israelite, he has not yet died on the cross. I'm looking forward. Constantly I'm having the unfolding of the revelation about the masculine singular that was mentioned back in Genesis 3.15. And I'm learning even as I come to the prophets, he's, you know, he not, he's, we already know of the sacrifice. He has to die. Isaiah 53 tells me even more about that and so forth and so on. I'm learning. I'm gathering that data. But that's what it's pointing to. That's, what, that's who is being instructed. That's who's being talked about. Not the animal. The animal is only a picture lesson. It's only a way of communication. We, we want it often on words. They did it in pictures as well as words. And it's pointing to that. that the, when I read Isaiah 53, it's not efficacious. It doesn't save me. It tells me how to be saved. It points me to the one who will do it tells me about what he's doing and that's what's efficacious at that point so as you come yes I would agree with you as you come to Ezekiel at that point they are pre Christ and they are looking at this as worship in the manner which they have already understood but it was worship because they're declaring what the Messiah will do and obviously when they get to that time it's going to be they're going to be post not pre uh, worship, you know, or pre pre Christ. I don't know, you know, if we got presupposed. This is a pre pre uh, Christ uh, death, uh, pre pre efficacious work, and we're in a post efficacious work uh, for us that of the actual act of His work is that is referred to in the New Covenant. But they, but the, you know, I wouldn't make a big deal about the fact that their worship is a uh, it, whether it is. Uh, looking forward or whether it's looking back. Uh, in the, I'm just simply saying it's memorial in the sense they're looking back in the actual reality of when this e these events will take place. But what they're doing is simply recounting what he will do and when they do it at that point it's going to have to be by the very fact of time what he did do in the past. But it is a representation at that point. 